In this campaign, we will be playing Five Leagues from the Borderlands, 3rd edition. Five Leagues from the Borderland is a miniature game written by Ivan Sorensen. It is published by Modifius Entertainment and it's at of this video set to be released in June 2022. Although if you pre-order, you get a copy of the PDF, which is what we've been using to play this game. The events in this game are procedurally generated. Therefore, the results of various dice rolls will build the scenarios that you'll have to play out. You can choose to pick your own characters, but again, options are there to roll them and roll their equipment so that you can have access and to those characters in-game. A rule set is provided to be able to resolve battles and other various items through the game. It makes up for a portion of the rule book, but the majority are the events and the procedural generated components. This game is originally intended to be a solo play, where the events are determined by the roles, and then you play with an AI built enemy and you use the rules to resolve your battle. But you can also split your warband and play co-op, having two different players control partial pieces of your warband. The game is miniature agnostic. Therefore, it is not bound to any range. You use whatever you want. It was tested at the 28 millimeter and, and or 15 millimeter range. You can go lower, or use whatever you want at the end. Use the miniatures you have or get new ones to complement the pieces you're missing. It's up to you. The rule book gives you a framework and has the foundation to build your campaign. It allows you to take your war ban and run them through the story. Details of the story are up to you. You decide exactly how certain things happen because doesn't go into that much detail. You fill in the gaps with the narrative that you want your story to play. After all, it is your story. A few housekeeping items. For my campaign, I will be playing at the 15 millimeter scale. Models will be 3D printed after I roll all the encounters pre-game. So I'll be building the terrain. Some of it will be 3D printed, some might be crafted to complement the encounter I'm just about to get into. I'll try to mimic the environment as best as possible. So if I'm gonna be in a forest area, I'm gonna get some trees and probably have a grass mat. If I'm in the mountains, there'll be some mountains and more appropriate terrain for that encounter. During my campaign, anytime I roll for events or resolve combat, I will show the results of the roll. This will allow others to compare with the rules to understand what's going on. The results of those will also allow me to build the narrative of my story that I'll be telling. Some items will also be house ruled. There will be a little icon, a little house with the book, to display which items that I'm going to be house ruling. So look out for that. I'll also explain why I applied that house rule for that specific event. I will also make mistakes, so please feel free to leave a comment or feedback so I can improve my future gaming turns. Now enjoy the journey. Before we start on our campaign, let's start by creating our warband. In the book, it is recommended we start with four heroes and two followers for your original warband set. For modifiers, your warband has the ability scores shown here. So an agility of one, which determines when you get to go in the quick action or later. Your speed, which is four inches move and a three inch dash. Your combat skill, which is applied to when you're fighting. And your toughness, it applies to when you get wounded. So everyone has a toughness of three starting out. Modifiers to these stats will be fleshed out 
as we go through the process of creating a character. Now, our first house rule. Notice the house with the book. I am going to be rolling on a modified origins table. So when you create a hero, you are to roll on an origins table, which will determine essentially their race. The author added dwarves as an add-on after the release of the book. There is a document in the Discord and in the Facebook group explaining the rules around dwarves. What I did is I added them into the initial character origins role. So 71 to an 80 on a D100 will get me a dwarf. Second house rule item, I'm rolling for my human background options instead of picking them. There are four available in the book. So basically I went from left to right. You roll a D6 and a one, you pick the first one and etc. On a five or a six, that human becomes a mystic. Now let's look at the results of our rolls. Now there's a lot of information to look at here. And keep in mind, the house rule I applied here is whenever the book says choose an item, spells, and weapons, I rolled everything. So let's take a look at hero number one. I outline all the die rolls. So if it's a d100, a d6, a d20, etc., it's all written there. And in brackets after, you see the results of which I've rolled. And enhance the selection that came from the tables in the book. Now looking at hero number one, I rolled a d100, got a 24, which meant the origin is now human. But on the background, on the house rule that I said, I rolled a d6. If it was a five or six, it would be a mystic. So in this case, it was a six. This origin now upgrades to a mystic. Your capabilities, mentalities, possessions, and training are all d20s. Those will essentially add modifiers or items to your hero. So in this case, I got a casting increase because I rolled a 12. Uh, my mentality ended up getting a plus two will on a roll of a one. Uh, for possessions, I ended up rolling a 16, which gave me an item. I rolled again a d5 for that, and then and I'm giving me the silver tree leaves. And the training, I rolled a d20 with a 16. It gives me a plus one XP to my character. As you follow along to the other four heroes, it's pretty much the same process going forward. Now, going into a follower, you don't have to roll everything. You only roll on a d100. All your followers have to be humans. So on a d100, they essentially get a uh, background, if you will. One of your followers gets to be equipped with light armor. So I rolled a D2, and then the first follower end up winning, so they got the light armor. And then the second follower, because at the end of all of my weapon rolls, I only had one ranged weapon, I gave the second follower a self bow as a ranged weapon. After rolling for your heroes and your followers, you then get to get two quality weapons to assign to any hero, two basic weapons to assign within your heroes. Your heroes will have either two suits of partial armor and two suits of light armor to share between them, and one helmet and a shield. For your mystic, you get to pick two spells and roll three, and in this case, I rolled all five of them. So you can see they're D100 rolls and it tells you exactly which spells I end up getting. Now you see all the rolls. Now let's take a look how those affected the characters and created the narrative of who they will become. Our first hero, Athena Everbleed. She is our avatar. In this game, your main character is also outlined as an avatar. 
Essentially, they're supposed to be representing you in this game. The story is told out of her eyes. The benefits of the avatar is they get plus one will and plus one luck added on to their character. As you can see, she is a mystic. And she has the warhammer and was given the partial armor, helmet, and shield. You can see in the skills and proficiencies, as human, she gets plus one to speech, and then her origin will affect certain extra skills. In this case, she has the driven skill. So if I ever increase her will during a level up, you get to plus two XP. Her background in this story is Athena comes from the empire of Thorfinn. She's born from a line of powerful mystic warriors. Think of it as part of the Faceless. Her cousin, leading the Dragon Tooth Company to conquer Nalaria. She felt that she should have had command of that company. So with that, she decided to leave and prove herself as the better warrior, as the better leader. Her uncle was against it, ordered her to stay, but she sailed off into a new region to make her mark in the world. Our second hero, Sable Highmore. Again, another human was given the staff, self bow, automatically coming with a light weapon, and equipped with the light armor. Same skills and proficiency due to being a human as well. Now, Sable's story is she was a childhood friend of Athena from the local town that they all lived in. They used to play as children, and as they grew up, they had a bond. Now, she knew that Athena was leaving, but as a commoner, if she left with Athena and she conquered the other region, she could position herself to be a noble in that new world. So agreeing to follow Athena is exactly what she plans to do. Our third hero, Crimson Storm. Now Crimson Storm is a preen. Think of it as a bird person. Now, this preen comes with special skills. Because they're preen, they get plus one for crafting. They also have an out outburst skill or proficiency, whatever you want to call it. So, again, if an ally gets, goes down within six inches or is hit by a spell or a ranged weapon, they have to dash towards the, the closest enemy and gain and melee benefits. Uh, swift footed, so a bit more speed, and uh, no counterattack from higher ground. So, I uh, was given a war spear. Also, we had a standard weapon that we gave the preen. Uh, light armor was equipped. Now, Crimson Storm's story is that she's from a preen tribe. And she was told to assist Athena to oversee her quest. As Athena made a deal with that tribe that if she was to conquer Nalaria, she would give a portion of that region to their tribe so that they could move and expand into that region. And in turn, the tribe would award Athena with a preem army that would help her into her conquests to take over more regions. And the final hero, Omen Shade. This hero is a Duskling, with an automatic background of an outsider. Now, due to her origin, she gets a skill of traveling, plus one. Also receives the Brute Charge skill, so no parrying, entering melee, and gets the reroll on the first exchange. Has the Oath of Life skill, or proficiency. Uh, counter-attack against undead, and the distrust, so not too keen on the magic tar targets. 
uh, comes with a bastard sword that w was rolled under possession. And uh, we changed a bastard sword for a great axe, but the stats are exactly the same. Uh, given partial armor. And so Omen Shade's story is that she was defeated by Athena during a duel of champions. And as losing this duel, she's now bound to Athena as per the traditions of her tribe. So she must follow Athena around and aid her to make up for the shame of the loss in combat. Now our first follower, Lathena Black. Due to a follower, the stats are very standard. She so get the standard weapon and the light armor, but everything else is pretty generic. Uh, the story we find Lithia is that she's a divine servant of the gods and is on a holy quest. And before Athena left, she requests Lithia's aid into her conquest to gain favor from the gods so that she can make sure that her cause which is true in the eyes of the gods. Follower number two, Damien Knox. Well, Damien was given the self bow and the light weapon with no armor. Everything else is very standard, like the other follower. Damien's story is very simple. He is Athena's faithful servant. So, followed around back in the Empire, had to do anything she requested. So he really had no choice in accompanying her on her conquest. He's along for the ride whether he likes it or not. Now let's walk through how to create a campaign. A little note before we start. I did my best to randomize the locations of everything that goes on your map. So, imagine a grid of coordinates, 10 by 10 on a map, numbers 1 to 10 from the top, 1 to 10 on the side, X, Y axis. I rolled two D10s, one being X, one being Y, and those generated the coordinates of where items landed on the map. So throughout this campaign creation, whenever you see a bracket with a number, common number, that's because I rolled two D10s and those are the results of where they went. If I rolled the exact same number of something that already exists, I re-rolled. Now step one of creating the campaign is setting up the region. Easy. Find a name. And again, I like to randomize everything. So I went to fantasy name generators online and created names for everything. Names of my characters, names of my cities, my or villages, sorry, my hamlets, my towns, my regions, my forests, my seas. They're all generated from random name generators. So step one, Nilaria is the name of the region. Now moving to step two, you have to establish settlements. So you roll a d100. In this case, I got 26 which gave me one hamlet, one village, and one town. And within each of these settlements, you have to roll another d100. So for the hamlet, I rolled a d100. I rolled an 83, but due to it being a hamlet, it gets minus 10 on the roll, giving me a 73, making it a market town. I named it Fairview. Second, the village, an 84. It's straight dice, becomes a training hub and named Shore Beach. And the town, D100, end up being 41. It gets a plus 10 because it's a town, giving it a 51. That end being a manor called Waydale. Step three, create your map. Now this is where you get your creative juices flowing. You can draw a map on a piece of paper. You can use an application to build a map. You can use a real map and rename or use existing names. You can do whatever you want. But in this case, I chose to use the incarnate map application. I've seen a lot of these. They look very nice. I also looked at the book and it said, you know, 
suggestions of things that should be in your map is a forest. You can have a swamp, mountain, river, hills. So I decided to add all of them and a sea. But I wanted my sea to kind of be on the corner of the map. So what I did is I broke the corners up. Top left is a one and then clockwise every corner. So I rolled a one. So my sea ended up on my top left corner. Then my forests, my rivers, swamps, mountains, and hills all got rolled. Uh, keep in mind, it's where they start. I kind of expanded on them. Once all my starting points were in, then I filled the gaps with the forest and uh, hills and mountains so it would look nice. A little bit of uh, a creative rights there. I didn't roll everything. The river, though, I rolled where the river started, where it ended, and then I had to make sure that it left the sea and intersected both points and then left the map. So it was pretty interesting what, how the map looks after applying all of those coordinates. We'll take a look at that shortly. Step four, determine your threats. So we'll just go to step five as well because you have to establish the threat levels. We'll combine them together. Essentially, you're gonna have three threats that are going to be in your regions at the moment. Your first two threats are called the foes within. So you roll on a D hunter table. I select, I got two of them. I got the ruins within, and then I got the gnawing horde. And then the foes, you get to roll once on the foes without. I got the faceless kingdom. And then to attain the, the threat levels, one of them gets to be a threat six, the other two a threat five. So I rolled a D3. Got a one. The first one on the list got to be a six. The other one's got to be a five. So that's step four and step five completed. Moving to step six, you get to add additional points of interest. So one delve, to which I rolled, and one explore region. And then you also get to place one camp for every single threat that you have. So the three threats got rolled. At the same time, I got to generate some colorful names for them. So the Runes Within are the Brotherhood of the Flame, my Gnawling Horde are the Forsaken Skull, and my Fearless Kingdom, or sorry, Faceless Kingdom, are the Dragon Tooth Company, which if you caught it, Athena is from the same kingdom. Step seven, note down hideouts. They don't appear on your map right now, they just exist. So once you get through the camps, eventually you need to find these hideouts and take care of them. Step eight, select a starting point. Where are you on your map? Where are you coming in from? On mine, I'm going to be the ship on the west of the map. And with that, let's take a look at the map. Let's see what kind of procedural generated map this all these roles end up giving me. And there we are, the map of Nilaria. All of these items are procedurally generated and their locations. Yes, if the roll was in the water, I pushed it close to the shore. Where possible, there's a little bit of tweaking that was required. But all in all, it made a very fantasy-esque map, which turned out very well. Let's take Fairview as an example. I rolled a 5-5, five, five, so from the top left hand corner you count five going to the middle five going down cross that and that's where i put fairview shore beach is your village waydale is your town there are different sizes your delve is on the west side across the ocean your uh, unexplored location is towards the east you have your three camps set up and then the rest is just some forest hills and swamps, mountains, just to fill up the clan. Oh, and I almost forgot our warband is on the ship coming from the west side. And now the adventure begins. Let's start turn one. The Calamitous Combine, the name of our warband, has departed on their adventure. So when you start your first campaign turn, you skip the preparation stage, step one through seven. So let's just get rid of that up top. 
your adventure is set to explore a location automatically because you're essentially traveling into the map and you got to find your first location where you want to land. The ship has plotted a course to Shore Beach. It will be the first explored location in this region. The Calamitous Combine has secured a vessel. Sail across the Sea of Eldosa. They've been sailing for days. And all of a sudden, in the horizon, they see storms a brewing. Athena quickly tells Omen, work with the captain, get us through this storm safely. Omen uses her traveling skills, but even with her best attempt, they are now lost at sea. They'll have to wait the storm out and get their bearings when the way is clear. Having no choice but to settle in, they will be camping at sea for the remainder of this turn. The warband hopes that in the next turn they will actually hit land and continue on their adventure. Until then, we will see you in the next chapter.